Okay, this week we're going to be looking at uh, the late 19th century and the early 20th century. As we saw last week, uh, the 19th century was a century of great revolutions in painting. We had, the, for the first time, a great divergence uh, between artists and their society or their community, and the birth of the avant-garde, which is the idea of an artist, uh, his or herself, having a vision or a style or a way of thinking about art and developing art that usually ran counter to the status quo uh, or to the society. Uh, this ended in the 19th century with a movement known as post-impressionism and three main artists attached to that, uh, Vincent van Gogh, Paul Cezanne, and Paul Gauguin. Each of these three artists developed a very singular vision of art. They weren't part of following any school or any style. Uh, they had their own way of doing things and and their three directions, their three approaches, led to three of the biggest uh, movements in the 20th century, as we'll begin to see in a second. Uh, Van Gogh, who many of you know as the painter of Starry Night, very famous painting, maybe even some Hollywood films, um, was famous for his uh, passionate, intense kind of vision in his paintings. He painted constantly, uh, every day, uh, but his whole artistic career was really only about 10 years long. Uh, but it was pretty intense. He was a preacher. He had a very strong, uh, passionate, visionary uh, sense to himself. And so his paintings reflect that sort of intensity, uh, as well as the thickness of the brush stroke. And we see here in Starry Night, we get these swirls in the sky surrounding stars and, and the moon. And many people say, well, this is how Van Gogh saw the world. It's not actually quite true. He didn't see the world physically like this, but he felt the world like this. And that's what he was doing. He's beginning to put into paint how he felt about things. And so for Van Gogh, uh, his starry night, the, the earth and the sky and, and the towns p below was, was full of energy and movement and life. And so he wanted to record that sort of swirling motion and energy that he found uh, all around him in life. And so we get an artist really creating a very singular way of looking at the world that's very unique to them. Uh, and in Van Gogh, uh, this took the route of being very visionary, very intense, very passionate. Uh, his sunflowers, for which he was very famous for, um, he wasn't famous for in his lifetime, but became very famous in the later years of the 20th century for the record prices they were uh, getting at auction. Uh, Van Gogh sold only one painting his entire life. Uh, he died under suspicious circumstances. People are not sure whether it was suicide or an accident or possibly even murder. Uh, but he died to a gunshot wound to his stomach uh, in poverty. Uh, not very many friends and uh, not a very successful life as a painter. And his works since then have come to be recognized as great masterpieces. Another study by Van Gogh of irises. Uh, the other artist uh, that's important in our three artists of the post-impressionist period was Paul Cezanne. Uh, Cezanne focused a lot on outdoor paintings and still lives. Uh, again, he was developing his own personal style in terms of the brushwork. Here we have little sections of brushwork going in various directions, building up the form uh, of the image. And he was uh, very influential on people like Picasso because they saw a very sort of geometric kind of abstraction happening and you can see in the trees uh, in the sky or even the side of the building and he also played with perspective he got things wrong on purpose in order to sort of show angles and viewpoints that couldn't actually be seen uh, exactly that way one of them here would be the side of the building uh, we see this roofed building um, but the roof line stays completely horizontal uh, going across, which is not something you would normally get. Uh, it's not that far off, but he began to experience and experiment with this uh, in greater detail as he went on. Uh, and then the third member is, is Gauguin, whose work um, was heavily influenced by the South Sea Islands and Tahiti. Uh, he spent several years there traveling back and forth between uh, um, Paris, France, uh, and the South Seas. And his record of his time there uh, he recorded uh, the figures and the people and the landscape and, and again a very distorted look at the size of her hand and her arm in a very abstracted way so the dresses the sand uh, they the colors and the shading are very un untypical unnatural so you wouldn't get uh, for instance the pink dress on the right uh, the shading it doesn't really describe 
the volume of the form. We see more of the volume in, in the skin tones or in the arms and the face, or even the dress towards the, the right there with the white, the red dress with the white floral patterns. It's very flat. There's not a lot of development of shading. And the sand or the ground that they're sitting on is very similar in the front at the bottom of the picture as to the back of the picture. So space, depth, perspective, uh, shading, these were all things that began to be pushed to their limits, uh, eventually to be discarded as we move into the 20th century. Now the beginning of the 20th century was a time of even greater revolution in the 19th century. Um, we had in the first 10 years of the 20th century, revolutions in, in all the arts and in the sciences and in society and in politics that really um, had a dramatic effect on how the 20th century was going to unfold. If I was to sum it up in one phrase, I would say that at the beginning of the 20th century, all of these developments in art, culture, science, and politics were about breaking down existing structures and remaking new structures, whether that's remaking new art uh, or a new way of thinking about the physical structure of the world or in terms of the Russian Revolution creating a whole new kind of political structure. One thing that characterized this period was this complete dismantling of recognized and given forms in many many institutions uh, known in Europe and the rebuilding and the reassembling of those pieces into new uh, forms. So three of the most influential people in this time uh, in music, science, and literature would be people like Stravinsky, uh, Einstein, and Joyce. In Stravinsky's music, he began to tap into very primal rhythms uh, that were very un-Western in a European sense and very tribal. Uh, he also dealt with discordant notes, two notes that go together that don't sound good together. Uh, and so all of this added to... Um, you know, a type of music that many people found very violent, uh, chaotic, crazy. Uh, his early symphonies are often met by protests from the audience. But now his music is pretty staple, it's pretty mainstream. We hear a lot of discordant notes or dissonance, for example, in movie soundtracks when you watch films and the bad guy or action scenes are happening. We get those very sort of uh, strange sounds that to our ears are just another part of the repertoire of music, but to people in the early 20th century uh, were, the, were the musical equivalent to ugliness in, in say, the visual arts. Einstein did the same, same thing in, uh, in science. He took our understanding of the world, which was largely based on Newton and Newton's mechanics of motion and, and gravity, and turned it upside down and inside out and demonstrated that the world is, is a very, very strange place. Uh, his work eventually giving way to quantum theory. Uh, so Einstein was able to demonstrate that space is not absolute and neither is time, meaning that space can, can contract, it can bend, it can stretch, and the same with time. Time could slow down, speed up, bend, all of these things. And so his theories of relativity uh, really sort of uh, knocked down the house of cards that Newton had built and, and showed us a world that was very, very strange indeed in terms of its inner workings. And James Joyce in literature took the basic structure of the, of the narrative plot and dismantled it. He took away any kind of development of the plot in his famous work, Joyce's uh, Ulysses or Finnegan's Wake, and added much more of a freestyle uh, form of con you know, automatic conscious writing, pre-association, uh, creating uh, jumps from the past to the future into different spaces, into different characters which became very confusing for readers at the time, um, but eventually, you know, was, he was recognized as probably one of the greatest writers, and not the greatest writer of the 20th century in terms of his revolutions in literature. Uh, just to give you a sample of, of this in terms of, let's say, Joyce's literature, his, one of his last books was called Finnegan's Wake. Uh, it's a very thick book, but is really an unreadable book. And anybody you know that claims to have read Finnegan's Wake uh, is either a liar or they're one of about four people currently living on the planet. Uh, here's what I mean. This is the first paragraph, two paragraphs from his book Finnegan's Wake. So I'll let you just look at it for a second. And if you're like most people, you're already lost by about line two. Uh, the book continues like this throughout. Uh, none of this is nonsense. Uh, there have been 
studies and there are companion books you can read with Finnegan's Wake that explain everything in it. So to fit into uh, James Joyce, it made an awful lot of sense. So for example, just the very first few words, river run past Even Adams. Even Adams was the name of a pub on the river in Dublin. So the river that ran past the pub called Even Adams. So everything was uh, coded in a way that it doesn't make sense to the outside casual viewer, but to people who wanted to crack the code and study the book, and like I say, there are very few of those people on this planet, um, every reference in the book checks out and makes complete sense. So very fascinating novel uh, that sort of dismantled uh, the typical narrative of, of literature and, and allowed writers greater freedom in, in how they would uh, portray their plots and their characters and the events. One of the early movements of the 20th century um, that grew out of the influence of Gauguin and his bright colors and his flat shapes was something called Fauvism. Fauvism uh, was uh, the word Fauve means wild beast and that was the name given to it by a critic when he looked at their paintings. Uh, the leader of the Fauve movement uh, was Henri Matisse and here we see his painting The Red Room. A uh, critic looked at it and said, you know, anybody who paints like this is, is a wild beast. These aren't natural colors. The world doesn't look like this, and these people have serious uh, eye issues. Uh, the name stuck, like most names of art movements. They're usually derogatory terms provided by an outside or later generation. But Matisse was struck by the power of color, uh, the emotional power of color, the expressive power of color. And he, like many of his uh, contemporaries, including Picasso, were quite bored of the traditional Renaissance way of imaging the world through paintings. Now that the camera had been invented uh, back in the early 19th century, painting had lost its purpose in terms of recording the world optically and doing portraits of people and events. The camera did it quicker, cheaper, and in many cases much better. And so painting had to find another outlet, another uh, direction. And that kind of internal, expressive, visionary uh, approach is something that came to dominate uh, painting from the mid 19th century on and here's Matisse just taking color and pattern and flatness to an extreme where any sense of depth or, or perspective or proportion uh, is kind of thrown out the window and what's happening here is like I said about the early 20th century everything's broken down and in this case the traditional ideas of space and is reassembled in a different way and Matisse has reassembled this uh, as a sort of exploration and a joyful uh, expression of color and pattern and shape. Uh, here's a painting of Matisse by another Fauve painter called André Duran. Um, if you look at this painting, people at the time freaked out. They said, this is the kind of stuff my child could do. Uh, now I look at this and I think many parents would wish that their children could paint like this. Um, what was so shocking at the time would be the colors. You know, you just look at his face, his nose has a purple stripe a yellow stripe and a pink stripe and people maintained rightly so that noses don't have those colors on them uh, but Matisse wasn't interested in that and, and the faux painters in Duran they were interested in using color uh, to create an effect and we still have a very three-dimensional looking portrait very convincing portrait of Matisse but the colors have been liberated uh, they're no longer tied to their uh, typical objects you know so yellow is not just about suns and bananas and pink for dresses and little flowers uh, they're used in a much more freeform expressive way that to the young people at the time was very exciting and to the older generations um, was very troubling uh, Kandinsky was another early painter of the early 20th century. He was very influenced by all the changes in art, the whole idea of breaking things down into simple forms. Uh, Brancusi is a sculptor we're going to see soon who did the same thing sculpturally. But for Kandinsky, he began to abstract and simplify, uh, in this case, landscapes and buildings. And his work eventually began to lose and become more and more abstract. And there's an old story that one day he went out at lunchtime for a few drinks and he came back uh, a little bit drunk and his cleaning lady had cleaned his studio and put one of his paintings back up on the easel um, but she had put it on upside down so when he walked into the room Kandinsky did not recognize the painting as his but more importantly he was shocked by it and thrilled by it because it was pure color to him he, he didn't know what he was looking at when he turned his head upside down he could recognize it as being a painting. So for Kandinsky, the elements of painting, the color, the line, the shape, the composition, the rhythm, these were all very spiritual 
uh, things he felt that spoke to the soul and to the human spirit. And he associated them a lot with music. We listened to what could be called abstract music. You know, if you listen to Beethoven or Mahler or Schubert or Mozart, they're not songs about anything necessarily. They're just pure sounds arranged in a, a clever or pleasing or interesting way. In the same way Kandinsky felt that he could rearrange images on a, on a canvas not to correspond to the real physical objective uh, visible world but to a world um, but create a whole new type of reality using pure color and pure shape. Eventually this led him to this um, where it's just no reference to the outside world whatsoever. This is a whole new type of painting. And so again, we had the same dynamic happening. Young people were excited by this. Older people, and this time would include people like Cezanne and, and Gauguin and even Van Gogh, he was alive at the time, saw this as, you know, disgusting, dr dribble, not, not painting at all. And let's remember that their work was also considered that way when they first came out. So we're seeing a very interesting progression uh, through... Uh, art, which was referred to at this period in time as modernism. Here we have Brancusi, who I mentioned earlier. He did the same thing with sculpture that Kandinsky was doing with images. Here's a, a sculpture of a head, a very simplified head, a very abstract head, just enough details to get the shape of the head, the mouth, the nose, and hints of eyes. And as he progressed through his career, he slowly began to take more stuff out and simplify. Um, same thing happens with Picasso. And here's Picasso in 1943. Um, by this time he was an old man, uh, maybe not too old, and uh, he was painting pictures like this. And he, sorry, he originally painted pictures like this. This is a painting by Picasso when he was 14 years old. Uh, his father was an art teacher, and this is an extraordinary painting for any 14-year-old. Highly realistic, um, full command of the paint, of the composition, of the drawing abilities. Um, and so what makes someone go from that to this? Well, the answer is multi-layered. At one level, boredom. Yeah, by painting like this, you're painting like now a million other painters all over the planet and all through the last uh, two or three hundred years. Um, but more importantly, this type of painting for Picasso and for many people at least had more expressive quality. So here's a painting called First Steps. It's a mother helping her child to walk. Picasso felt that the kind of awkwardness of a child learning to walk, the lack of balance, um, the way children look straight ahead and the way that the parents hunch over them and the, the precariousness of the step in the raising foot and the way the hands sort of grasp and grapple with each other. For Picasso, this kind of disjointed, almost mechanical way captured the idea of a first walk, of a toddler kind of teetering with the mother helping him and all those expressive elements much, much better than any kind of realistic photograph type painting of the event. So for Picasso, he was interested in dismantling the human figure, taking it apart, and then putting it back together again in a way that was interesting and compelling. And, and so he was using distortion. And so we have the eyes are kind of different levels and uh, different, you know, very big, uh, in a way that creates a, a sense of imbalance or wobble or movement. He's not trying to be totally and completely um, true to the eye. And again, look at the chin. The chin's a circle. In the much the same way a child might draw a chin by putting a circle around it. Um, but Picasso draws our attention to the, the roundness of children's chins. And also if you look at the fingers with the, the creases and the, and the interlocking fingers with the mother, very awkward, very fragile, very graspingly uh, depicted. So for Picasso, this was a, a new language, a new visual language um, that grew out of his developments of Cubism that many, many artists got extremely excited about and imitated in, in many ways. Cubism, as I said, was a movement that he had developed um, largely from this painting called La Damoiselle d'Avignon, the Ladies of Avignon, uh, pictures of uh, women in a brothel. And this was a very um, dynamic painting at the time. He kept it hidden. Even his best friends thought it was vile and disgusting. But eventually it caught on um, because of its uh, lots of reasons. One was its uh, primal kind of animalistic brutality. Uh, a lot of this comes from his uh, studying of African masks. You can see in the two figures on the right where they simplified the face into geometric shapes and forms. And Picasso felt that this had much more expressive power than a typical eye or a typical nose in the European style. Also, the picture lacked all sorts of depth. 
uh, Picasso had flattened the picture plane. What's in the back is as important as what's in the front. And he was no longer interested in creating illusions, of creating things that would fool the eye. He's, he's letting paint create things that only paint could create. And so for him, it had a lot to do with um, this kind of energy, this primal energy of, of getting back in touch with, with nature and, and life's forces and life's powers at a time in European history uh, where World War I was just on the horizon. Uh, European civilization had come to what it considered was a peak of civilized development. But for many of the artists at the time, they, they saw all of that as a sham. They saw the hypocrisy um, behind the, the gentry and, and European bourgeois and how they were living their lives and at the same time behind people's backs, you know, um, visiting prostitutes, taking drugs, and then going to church on Sunday and, and dressing nice for, for, the, for the families. And things. so it was this veneer of civilization that many artists were responding to and thinking it's, it's very um, hypocritical and long to get back to something fresh, something raw, something earthy, something that Gauguin had felt and, and sensed and brought back to Europe from his trips in the South Sea Islands. And so here's some of the masks that Picasso was looking at, as were other artists. So a huge influence on 20th century and late 19th century art was the art of non-Western cultures. This opened up possibilities for artists to do things in ways they had never dreamed of doing. And so these sorts of masks, you look at the, the facial expressions, the eyes, the mouths, they're, they're, they're kind of cartoony, they're kind of very primitive. Um, but at the same time, for artists trained in the tradition of painting realism, these provided much more uh, joy and excitement and interest in how can I build pictures using these kinds of forms. And so it easily led into cubism, of which there's two phases. The early phase is called analytical. To analyze something is to break it down, and you can think of these pictures as sort of breaking down the image, dissolving it. So we see a woman with a guitar, and she's being broken down into the background. The background is kind of merging with her. And so our sense of what's what's in the foreground, what's in the background, what's solid, what's empty space, becomes uh, broken down. We can no longer tell the difference. Sort of very similar to a lot of the things Einstein was saying in science. And so this analytic phase of cubism, uh, the artists Brock and Picasso began to abstract forms to simplify and as this went on it got more and more broken down. Here's a portrait of an art dealer named Volar, uh, Picasso's dealer, and you can see him at the top with his head looking down and further down you can see his, his coat and his jacket and his tie, and, but very very hard to see. Analytic cubism tended to be kind of subdued colors, browns, grays, blacks, uh, and very difficult to sort of make out the forms and what was in the background, what was in the foreground, uh, all became merged and dissolved into one uh, unity. Synthetic cubism came after and was a variation on this, and this was the idea of putting things together, synthesizing. It was a different way of approaching, and it tended to be brighter, more colorful. And here we have Picasso's three musicians. Uh, where he's sort of adding these shapes for the instruments and for the musicians for their legs and their hands sort of making it up and putting it in um, it wasn't just taking something and breaking it down so it becomes has a very strong design element and there's lots of little hidden things you can see the dog on the left you see his uh, head and, or shadow of the head and his paws and his tail um, so you know things were mixed in things looked like they were just cut out on colored paper and stuck down and this led naturally to collage uh, we see here is a collage piece um, of a table with a wine glass and a, and a drink on it and a newspaper and wallpaper. And this was Cubus in the sense we just kind of broke everything down, but it was synthetic in the sense he was putting things together. Things are a little more colorful, a little more joyous. And also he was taking things from the real world and sticking it in the paintings. And this goes back to the whole notion of the everyday. The idea of the everyday has had a huge influence for the hundred years we've just been looking at. From when the realistic painters and the impressionist painters began to paint everyday scenes, people sleeping, people walking, this was seen as an extraordinarily radical move because art was supposed to be about uh, moral lessons and, and mythology and religion. And, and so art had this kind of duty to aspire to these noble uh, subjects. And so when artists began to paint people holding their cat or dancing or walking, 
uh, many people reacted to the, the everyday as not something you put into art. Art is a sacred, special realm for culture. The everyday is everything else. But artists began to break that down by putting the everyday in their pictures. When we come to Picasso, what we have is he's literally putting everyday objects into the picture. These are real newspapers torn out and glued in. And he began to do that with lots of things, with rope and, and various other uh, musical scores. And so he quite literally was taking the everyday world and sticking it in the picture, really challenging that boundary between the picture and the world, or between culture and art and our everyday life. Uh, he invented a new form of sculpture known as additive sculpture, where he took uh, objects, put them together to make sculpture. Most people, sculpture was a subtractive process. You carved or you... Uh, um, chiseled away, but he also did it in an abstract sense. So he reduced the guitar to simple shapes and he inverted many of our notions. So for example, the guitar has a hole in it. Well, he decided to make the hole rather than go in, he made the hole come out. So he's playing around with all these things. He's being intentionally crude, all in the service of making something exciting, something different, and a new way of looking at things. And these sorts of changes had massive effects through society in terms of uh, clothing and furniture and style. People began to think of their life in terms of their style. What's my style? What do I like? And, and so looks and schools and, and periods and scenes began to develop where people gravitated to particular ways of doing things. And the visual arts had a, played a huge role in defining what these were. Um, probably Picasso's most famous painting is this called Guernica. Uh, Guernica was a small town in northern Spain that was bombed by the, the Nazis. Uh, Franco had offered Hitler Guernica as a test ground for uh, the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, their, their new weapons. So this was a helpless town of uh, farmers and peasants that the, the Germans just annihilated. And it, it shocked Europe. Europe was outraged that you know this kind of defenseless uh, town was sacrificed by Franco in the way that it was. And Picasso, being Spanish originally, responded to this by painting this huge painting. And what he did in this painting was, instead of painting what one might have seen in Guernica, he painted the idea of brutality and war. He connects it back to mythology and the, the Minotaur. Um, you get on the left side a woman screaming with her dead baby. Uh, you get a man slain at the bottom, a horse being stabbed. A uh, guy in a flaming building on the right. Uh, and Picasso felt that this kind of mythic uh, inhumanity, brutality, uh, was better portrayed uh, in black and white and in a cubist, chaotic style. So, like the woman on the left with the dead child, um, that mouth and those hands and that baby's neck, he felt that it had the sorrow and the power of death and, and grief and tragedy in a way that no painting of a realistic image could have ever portrayed. Maybe a photograph or a specific instance, but he didn't want this to be about something specific. He wanted it to be about war, terror, and brutality in general, hence the mythic notion of the, the, uh, the eye of God with a light bulb in the middle and the horse and the minotaur. So he's drawing on this long tradition of war and death and destruction by humans. Um, as a result, it's you know a very powerful, influential painting that many people recognize that you know through its cubist approach, uh, it retains much more expressive power than any kind of realistic take. Expressionism uh, was the third response. Uh, we've we've had cubism, we've had fauvism, expressionism came out uh, of Van Gogh's approach of expressing himself, and also lots of other currents. And we have the German expressionists, of which uh, Kirchner was one of the artists. And here he's painting bathers. This was really just a, a commune. Many people were. This is the era of the first communes. People were experimenting with getting away from civilization, and what they saw were the trappings of civilization, which I talked about earlier. And so they really had communes that experimented freely with love and sex, public sex, public nudity, uh, um, experimenting with drugs, and, and trying to get back to nature and, and trying to sort of get in touch with this more animalistic, uh, primitive, but the expression has felt a much more uh, meaningful, uh, genuine sense of, of who we are, uh, not constrained by the artificial uh, um, props of civilization, as it were.
Um, another response to this was constructivism. I know I'm moving pretty quickly. What we'll find in the 20th century is where we just have tons of isms, uh, one after the other. Uh, constructivism was a movement that came right out of the German, I mean, sorry, the uh, Russian Revolution. And the revolution was replacing an old uh, feudal structure with a brand new structure called uh, communism that had never been sort of really tried before or developed. And so it was considered a giant social experiment. And its, its architects, uh, people like Trotsky and Lenin, decided that well, they're making a whole new society and a whole new world and that the art should reflect that and that what artists should do is try and find a language that communicates to everybody. And they felt the best way to do that was to find a language that was basic. So it went back to basic forms, to shape, to color, to line. Uh, these were considered pure elements of visual language. And by making art out of these elements, like Malevich's painting here, or even posters um, that built on these elements, they felt they were not only creating a new society, but being able to communicate across the whole society. Well, the reality was nobody got it. So when we look at this painting by Malevich, only the, the makers and creators understood this. Your typical farmer looked at this and had no idea what he was looking at. And so it was a giant experiment that horribly failed. And eventually uh, all these uh, constructivist artists were run out of Russia and ended up influencing the rest of Europe and the United States. Uh, Russia turned back uh, in its real sort of typical totalitarian phase to what's called socialist realism. And here's what we get. Um, the image of the workers and the farmers and celebrating manual labor uh, and communist labor. And what's interesting in the 20th century is that the movement in the art world was going very abstract, uh, was going very experimental. But in the totalitarian regimes or the dictatorships, the movement was in the opposite direction. So we have Stalin praising uh, works like this. Uh, we have Hitler commissioning pieces like this. So Hitler and Stalin were both going back to realism in a sort of interesting way, that realism became synonymous uh, with this kind of um, dictatorial style that was somehow the right way of going and that modern art was hopelessly misdirected. So much so that Hitler even organized his own exhibition called Degenerate Art. And here he is arriving at the exhibition in which he took all the art that he had confiscated of the modern artists, the, the Brancusis and then the Picassos he can get a hold of, put them on the wall and showed everybody what not to do with art. This is degenerate art. This is art that is morally corrupting. This is not the art of the Third Reich. Um, the irony was people he put in this exhibition, especially the unknown ones, became very well known and famous at the end of World War II as a result of Hitler's exhibition. And then finally, we're coming to a style of architecture that began to dominate the 20th century, known as the International Style. This grew out of an art school in Germany called the Bauhaus. And this, again, goes back to those simple geometries. Uh, we saw that in Brancusi, we saw it in Kandinsky, where shape and line and form and rectangles and circles, these very basics, were part of what uh, defined the style and the look. And so, if you look at this and you compare it to buildings, you know, Baroque buildings or Rococo buildings or neoclassical buildings. Uh, these are very austere, very simple, but at the same time, very elegant, very domineering. They, sent, they communicate a sense of power and a sense of efficiency, and they really represented no frills, no uh, superfluous detail, just everything you needed, large, massive, shining, glimmering um, buildings that the, as, as a style became very international and defined the sort of the inner cities and the skyscrapers all over the planet and was given the collective name of the international style which is rather easy to remember